So in, all, in your experience doing uh, relational meetings over many, many years, what do you think are the, the major obstacles that we all confront in the challenge of being becoming better at this? What's it's just really thing? hard for most of us to really be good, engage and attentive listeners and pay attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. So we get locked into our own ideas or stereotypes or whatever. And, and so just to kind of put those aside, bracket those, if you will, is hard. Mm -hmm. It requires a real discipline and control. Got it. And how long have you been doing this kind of work? With the Industrial Areas Foundation since 1972. Holy cow. Prior to that, since 66, uh, 65, 66. Good golly. I, I won't tell you what grade I was in, but. <laughs> <laughs> what year? Were you what grade were you? Uh, well, let's see, it's 66. Actually, I was preschool. Okay. But I was alive, so. Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I hope you still are now. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're not just a task. They have a focus, clear goal. And that's why we teach that they're the most radical things that we have to offer. The ability to learn how to do this relational meeting. And we say it's radical because it goes to the root of the situation. So why is that important to you? I'm just curious. Okay. Just getting to, wanting to get to know a little bit more about you and kind of where you're from and how you connect with okay. the group here. and. What those, work, what those relationships, I guess, were like, whether it was, it sounds like a really deep, long-term relationship, which is nice. Well, let's put it this way. That, that's the aim. Now, the first relational meeting, the real relational meeting, should, come, should take no more than 30 minutes. However, don't do one with everybody. Do not do one with everybody. With most people, what you do is you cast a wide net. So if you're organizing inside of an institution, you do maybe five, three, two minute meetings with people. And then you decide after you've covered the waterfront, who are the people that you really want to get to know a little bit? Who are the people you want to invest time and energy in? We're looking for people who look interesting. Don't look for people who are kind of fit the stereotype that you have of a leader. If they look interesting, if they are interested, if they are relational, okay, if they look like they halfway have a sense of humor and they look like they care about something, then pursue them. Don't go through the checklist analysis of all the qualities and do they have all the qualities. Don't worry about that. Are they interesting? Do you, do, and can you make yourself interesting to them? Do they think you're competent? Do they think you're on their side? Do they think you're worthy of trust? And you can only discover that over time. We don't build trust automatically, instantaneously. It's something which is cultivated and sustained. And that's, again, why we have to be selective. We've got to be careful who we invest in. Organizing is, by definition, always, because it is a public process, selective. I know you don't like that. All of us are equal, but some of us to quote George Orwell, are more equal than others, okay? <laughs> All of us are equal. Some of us are more equal than others. The Gospel of Matthew talks about a sower going out to sow, okay? And he spreads the seeds. Some of it falls on rocks and is dried up. Some of it is, you know, you got people who are just severe. Some of it, you know, the, the, the birds eat it. We got lots of flighty people in our organizing efforts. Some of it goes into thorns, okay? And then some of it falls on good ground. Well, we're looking for the good ground when you do a relational meeting. Who are the people that you want to dig deep with? It's nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Malcolm Cohen. Malcolm yeah. Cohen? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Um, so you're from, uh, from Texas? I am. I am a, a member of the San Jose Catholic Church and, and a leader with Austin Interfaith. Okay. Um, and how, how long have you been doing that? Doing, being a Being leader? an organizer, yeah. Um, 25 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really impressive. Yes. Um, and tell me, I'm sorry, what, what do you do? Um, I'm a rabbi over on the west side of Las Vegas. Oh, okay. It's a neighborhood called Samalin. Okay. Yeah, so my uh, synagogue is called Temple Sinai. Okay. I yeah. love your accent. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, 
I, uh, I usually emphasise it when I think it will uh, help me <laughs> <laughs> to get my way. <laughs> to get your way, okay. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm, yeah, sometimes to uh, make, if it makes make me seem different, right? So then maybe people listen to me when you seem, you know, when you seem a bit different. You know, when your voice sticks out, right? You might have yeah. more of a chance of making people hear yeah. what you have to say. And I'm very attentive to that because I'm visually impaired. Right. Okay. So I, don't, I don't really see you that well, so. Okay. If I don't recognize you, I'm very you, handsome, I by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe you. It's a public conversation, not a private conversation, not chit chat, not getting to know you. It's not a questionnaire. It's not a you know. It's not interrogating somebody. It's a conversation, which implies reciprocity, give and take. Conversations require attentive listening. That's one of the skills that's required, attentive listening. Conversation requires a bit of calculated vulnerability. Offer a little bit of who you are, a little bit of your story, hoping that the other person will reciprocate. But in terms of you, you um, from, from what I've seen of, you, of you, Ophelia, over the last couple of days, you, you seem to have a sort of real power, like a presence. Right? You don't talk very loudly, but sort of when you talk, it's very thoughtful and considered. I found that quite impressive about you. Well, that's thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I didn't used to be that way. Okay. Um, I used to not even lift my head up um, I, because of my vision. I really kept in isolation forever. Um, I was raised that um, when I get married, I do what my husband says when he says how he says it. Mm -hmm. So I did it, and then he died in a car accident. And so I didn't know what to do anymore because nobody was telling me what to do. Oh, I see. We're not interested in hearing about tasks. We're not interested in hearing about projects. And if they start talking about tasks or projects and not themselves, then you've got to learn how to bust through that. And the only way you can do that is interrupt. So there has to be that willingness to kind of cultivate and look for tension. And you do so with a question. Well, yeah, and then you can always do the disclaimer. Well, I, this is what I've heard said. I mean, I'm just curious, okay? But there has to be that willingness to interrupt. So um, I have three daughters, and they were, they were very young, uh, six months, four and five years old, and I didn't know what to do anymore um, for two years. So uh, until I had my own uh, spiritual encounter okay. and got to know God's love, and all the fear went away. Wow. And they, he put in front of me an organizer <laughs> to teach me how to not be afraid. Okay. How to step up and how to talk and how to pick my head up and how to not cry all the time and, um, and learn how to have a conversation like I'm having with you. Okay, that's, that's, that's amazing. But um, so what, what was that like? Was were you saying that God spoke to you? Because you heard me before, right? I was being a, a little bit, un, you know, maybe un, un, unkindly cynical about God's voice. Um, but, um, it, in, well, uh, yeah, how did that happen? All right. You're looking for where the energy comes from. If you don't walk out of that relational meeting with energy, then you failed. You probably talk too much. You told too much about what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing. So you didn't get curious about the other person. And if the other person fails to do that, wants to just stay on task, the project we say, thank you very much. This has really been interesting. I hope we meet again someday in the new millennium. I mean, you don't say that, but you know. <laughs> but you move on to people who've got some potential. So I want to know, how, how did you end up as an Episcopal priest? Wow. Can you uh, give me like a, a Reader's Digest version of it? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, thank you so much for the first part there. And uh, yes. uh, I just kept sort of thinking it's kind of uh, an innate Texas BS kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so part of the discipline of doing relational meetings is learn how to put an element of discipline and calculation into these meetings. So it requires attentive listening, Enormous amounts of curiosity. You can't organize without curiosity. 
And your curiosity has to also be rooted in your imagination. Okay, so you were a Buddhist at one point. Yeah. You were raised Baptist? I was. Mm -hmm. In Texas? In Texas. That's deep. It was. Yeah, get it out was. the shovels. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah absolutely, <laughs> yeah, just as I am. Yeah, and, and so somehow in this adult journey of your life, you ended up through those different kind of uh, uh, the sieves, yeah, um, I sort of like there was a spiritual thing that was kind of up there, and then there was also a desire to be engaged in the world in some kind of transformative way. Mm -hmm. And life has been a process of trying to pull those together, which is kind of a lot of what this organizing thing is about for me. It's pulling together that spirituality into a very mm -hmm. grounded kind of transformation. But what about you? Well, it's part of a strategy of building an institution and reorganizing institutions. All organizing is disorganizing and reorganizing. And the first act of organizing is disorganizing, disruption. And ideally what you're trying to do as part of your institutional strategy is bring new people into your institution. People who've got fresh ideas, imagination, curiosity, energy, have got hope based upon their own experience. And you look for these people as you do these relational meetings. Who are the people that are going to make the more bun, okay, you know, institutional relationships come to life, give new energy, new meaning, new imagination to it? The problem with most of our congregations, our unions, is we don't disrupt them. We don't disorganize those relationships. We don't bring new people in. That's why we do these meetings. How do people, how did you learn that? I mean, just doing it, get making, this? making okay. a lot of mistakes, doing it badly, doing literally thousands of these meetings mm -hmm. uh, over the course of 40 years of organizing, right. uh, and doing some, even doing some which are extraordinarily good and then some which are extraordinarily bad. Uh -huh. Still, in other words, it's not, it's not like you ever get perfect at it, right. unfortunately. Right. right. And, there, and, and then recognizing, well, <clears throat> the other piece of it is, just kind of drawing from a lot of stories and experience and, and just, just kind of rigorously ch kind of challenging yourself to think differently about how to do these right.